could uh, find many different examples. But my question for us today that I want us to take a look at and examine, and we'll, we'll take a look through the, the scriptures of this too, is could it also be a self-fulfilling prophecy or a conditioned response that we inadvertently impose on our kids or live into as siblings? As I said, with my family, it was expected that my sister and I were not going to get along because my mom didn't get along with her siblings, my dad didn't get along with his siblings, so it was just kind of an expected thing that we weren't going to get along. A lot of the, the conversations that took place were listening to people say that, you know, of course, you're not going to get along with your, your sibling, you're not going to get along with your sister or your brother. It was just kind of one of those things that was expected. It was almost something that was imposed on us before uh, we even had a, cho a chance to make a choice of our own. And as a parent now, I listen to some of the conversations that take place uh, around my kids. And one of the areas, another self-fulfilling prophecy, have you ever listened to the conversations that people have uh, with other children around school? I've always been amazed at how many people have this attitude that kids have to hate school and homework. You ever hear people talk about this? I've had people talk to my kids as if they hate school. My kids actually love school, and I've been fighting my entire parent life along with Pam to make sure that they continue to like school, but people have this expectancy that they place on kids that you are supposed to hate school, you are supposed to hate homework. And my concern is, do we do the same thing when it comes to the relationships that our kids have with their siblings? that we expect them to not get along with their siblings, to fight with their siblings, to have problems with their siblings, and then the kids end up living into that. One of the things that we need to be concerned with is the issue of expectancy and accepting less than ideal. Let me explain this a little bit. When we have a set of things that we expect, like you're going to hate school, or you're not going to get along with your brother and sister, we have a way of imposing that through our conversations. We have a way of imposing that through the way we talk about these things, either as a parent or as someone close to other people, and we set an attitude to this. Or we develop this idea that this is just the way things are, and we settle for something that's less than ideal. A book that really touched me is a book called Do Hard Things, and it was written by two brothers, Alex and Brett Harris, when they were 18 years old. And as teenagers, they recognized that society, parents, other people had this attitude about them that as teenagers, that this was vacation from responsibility, that no one ever really expected anything of consequence or of substance from them, that they could, they could never rise above just being teenagers, irresponsible teenagers. So they wrote a book called Do Hard Things, talking about the fact that there's an expectancy that God has that all of us can rise to the top and do hard things, do important things, do challenging things. And they were, they were guided by the scripture passage, 1 Timothy 4.12, which says, don't let anyone look down on you for your youth. But it also goes on to say to set an example for the believers, to set an example for the believers. So in their book, they wrote Do Hard Things as a way of encouraging youth to realize that you can do more than what society is expecting of you. No one is expecting anything of you, but God has always expected a tremendous amount from you because God has placed abilities in you that you can live into, which is an awesome thing. And for me personally, I gravitate towards this because probably one of the worst things that you could ever say to me is, well, that's just the way things are. Has anyone ever said that to you? That's just the way things are. Um, one of the things uh, that's very important to me theologically is the concept that God has given us free will. And I take that idea of free will very, very seriously because I don't accept that things are just a certain way because that things are just a certain way and will always be that way because I truly believe that things are the way that we allow them to be, correct? 
So if we accept an expectancy that's placed on us by society, parents, other people in the family that siblings are not going to get along and we do nothing to change it because we just accept the fact that's just the way things are, then we're not living free will. We're, we're being guided by some preconceived notion, some self-fulfilling prophecy that is leading us. But I truly believe that we have the free will to change anything, anything in society. One of our greatest blessings is that God does not just have amazing grace for us, but he also has amazing hope in us. And if we take a look at the ministry of Jesus, we could see that. If God had no expectation that we could do more than just the normal, then why would he send Jesus into this world to teach us to love other people? Why would he send Jesus to challenge the status quo? Why would he send Jesus to do all the things that, that Jesus did? We see it displayed also in the story today of the prodigal son. If we take a look at this story, the son had two sons, correct? He gave them everything. Everything that they needed was provided for them. The one son just chose to take it early and the other son chose to stay with his dad. We see the love of God and the fact that God still, the father, never gave up on his son, always had this attitude that the son may return, which is why he was constantly looking out for him. And when he saw his son, went running for him, embraced him, put robes on him, rings on him, and threw a tremendous party. It's also evident in what he shared with the older son when the older son was upset about the younger son coming back, the sibling rivalry, rivalry coming in. The father didn't go and say, oh, it's normal, it's just your, your younger brother, you know how he is. He talked about him as, this is your brother whom we love. This is your brother who was lost and is now found. It is your brother that was dead and is now alive again. What an amazing thing that is. If we take a look through scripture, we see other areas in which God breaks the norms. When we take a look at King David from the Old Testament, he wasn't the oldest son. In that time in scripture, in, in that, that time in society, it was always the oldest son that got chosen for various things. It was the oldest son that got the birthright. But in this case, um, God sends Samuel to go, back, to go anoint a new king, and he goes, and he goes through all the sons, and it's not until he gets to the youngest son, David, that God says, that's the one I want, because God chose the youngest and the least significant of them, and that's the way God shows uh, his love and breaks norms and traditions across the board. Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman, eating with sinners, healing on the Sabbath, being resurrected from the dead, God is always breaking from the norms that are established. God shows that it's not about living into a self-fulfilling prophecy, but realizing that we have free will to change things in the way that we desire them to be, in a better way that they could be. Like God, we need to choose to not follow the expected and conditioned path when we had our lock-in with the youth the other night, one of the songs that they started to sing was from High School Musical uh, called Break with the Status Quo, right? <laughs> exactly. So that, that was reminding us of this idea of not, not living into a status quo, but breaking from it, breaking from the norms. In our own families, we need to follow God's example and willingly break from the norms, as siblings, just because we have a brother or sister doesn't mean that we have to fight with them. It doesn't mean that we can't be close with them. And we shouldn't accept what other people put on to us about what that relationship should be. We need to look at them as our brother and sister. I tell Nathan and Joel all the time, tell Joel, your brother is the only person in your entire life that you're ever going to be able to call brother. And tell Joel, you know, Nathan, that Joel is the only person in your entire life that you're ever going to be able to call sister. You're going to have a special relationship together that no one else gets to have, that no one else gets to share, because I want them to realize the importance of that so they live into something greater than I had the opportunity to live into. As parents, 
setting an expectation that our kids will love one another even when they bump heads. Are our kids going to bump heads? Absolutely. Are they going to have differences at times? Definitely. It's going to happen. But setting an expectancy that they are family first and that they love one another no matter what, so that at the end of the day, it's not about the differences, but about the things that connect them is an important thing. One of the things that Pam and I did as a family early on is we gathered the family together and we sat down and we put together a list of expectations and values that we have for each other. Joelle added to the list, Nathan added to the list, Pam and I added to the list, and it came together to be our family values and expectations. That's guided us through discipline, that's guided us through all sorts of things, and we hold one another accountable to that so that when things happen where brother and sister are fighting together, we go back to that and say, what is it that we value as a family? And what is it that's important to us so that that becomes the center and that becomes the cornerstone? As I was researching uh, this week on sibling rivalry, I came across a study that the University of Michigan uh, put together, and this is sort of uh, the practical tip uh, for today to help you with this and dealing with sibling rivalry and how to address it within uh, your family system. And this is what they concluded as something to help alleviate sibling rivalry. And they said, uh, have a family meeting. A family meeting is a meeting for all family members to work together to make family decisions. Parents, children, and any others who live in the home and have a stake in decisions affecting the daily life of the family should take part. Choose a time that works for everyone. Establish a set of rules. For example, no yelling or name calling. Everyone gets a turn. And allow everyone to have a say, even if members don't agree. The purpose of the family meeting is to recognize that everyone's opinion makes a difference. The meeting allows the family to share their opinions, seek understanding, and find resolutions to problems. Family meetings help to build cooperation and responsibility and make anger and rebellion less likely. Also, it is a time to share love, develop unity, and to build trust and self-esteem. The social skills and attitudes that children develop within the family circle are skills and attitudes they will carry with them the rest of their lives. Sample agenda might be discuss family issues, concerns, interests, positive events of the past week. Determine priority issues. Clarify the issue to be discussed. Generate possible solutions. Determine the most effective solutions. Make plans to implement the solution and plan one fun activity for the coming week. And then ground rules that they established for it. They said everyone gets a chance to talk. One person talks at a time and does not get interrupted. It's okay to say what you feel. No one has to talk, but everyone has to listen. And no one puts anyone else down. They put this together in their study as a conclusion about sibling rivalry, saying that one of the ways of helping with this is coming together and having a different tone set. A different tone set. Not an expectancy of fighting, but an expectancy of love, an expectancy of family. Whether you're a parent raising children, this is something that you could do with your family, or whether you're a child in a family that's been fighting for years, you can call a family meeting together in which everyone could sit down and talk about, at the end of the day, the one thing that binds us together is that we love one another. And how do we make that happen? We see that in this scripture from Luke today with the story of the prodigal son. When the father comes along the oldest son, that's what he's trying to establish. This was your brother. This is someone that we love. This is someone that was lost but now is found. It wasn't putting down. It wasn't condemning. It was setting a tone about what is important in our family, what is important in our relationships. So does sibling rivalry happen? Yeah. Have many of us experienced that from time to time? Probably. But does it have to be something that divides us? No. 
Remember the special relationship that you have with brothers, with sisters, with your family. Like I said before with telling Nathan and Joel, your brother is the only person you get to call brother. Your sister is the only person you get to call sister. Make that mean something. Set a tone for that. Set an expectancy that love rules out over rivalry. Amen? Amen. Amen.